Having discussed the structure of the psyche in previous vids, we turn now to the structure of consciousness. A list of sources is given at the end and more information is included in the Interpersonality Just My Type course. You can join the blog on this topic on the Interpersonality site. Part of the reason Jung gives for developing his typology is trying to reconcile the different psychologies expounded by his colleagues. Whilst Freud's approach to psychotherapy had some merit and worked for some people, so did Adler's. Neither worked in all cases with all people. Jung noted that the nature of experience is a mixture of subject and object. In other words, my experience of watching the sun rise is partly a function of the sun's rising and partly my own perception of that event, which may be very different to my friends, even though we are watching the same sunrise. The subjectivity of experience being an inescapable fact, Jung felt that attempts to model human experience, such as those of Freud and Adler, had to reflect the theorist's own predisposition and unresolved psychic tensions. Jung's typology was therefore an attempt to establish general principles that held for all individuals and could be used to better understand the content of individual experience. In other words, if he could discover the basic equipment common to all human psyches, Jung believed he could make better sense of how individuals use this equipment, what happens when things go wrong, and which of the many therapeutic approaches would be most effective. The first element Jung hit upon, which he studied for some 10 years, was what he called the attitude types. Two basic ways individuals directed their energy or libido. Unlike Freud's narrower definition of libido, Jung defined libido as psychic energy. Libido is what drives the process of growth and adaptation. It is the psyche's natural desire or impulse, the driving force that motivates everything that we do. Daryl Sharp says that Jung associated libido with intentionality. It knows where it ought to go for the overall health of the psyche. In each of us, libido has an instinctive flow. Either it flows habitually outward toward the object or inward toward the subject. These are the two basic attitudes Jung came to describe as extroversion and introversion. Jung saw extroversion and introversion as natural modes of adaptation. The extrovert, Jung says, is characterized by a positive relation to the object meaning the extrovert orients his or her life according to the outer world stimuli, while the introvert has a negative relation to the object. That is, the introvert's natural tendency is to retreat from outer world stimuli, orienting him or herself instead by subjective factors. It is worth noting that true to his scientific training, Jung viewed life as an ongoing process of adaptation. We are continually presented with new information and opportunities to make choices. And at the most basic level, our survival depends on successful navigation of changing circumstances. As Jung discovered, individuals have different ways of solving the problem of living. And these different modalities are the result of consistent biases in the way we use our common psychological equipment. So what is this equipment? In his Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, Jung describes several categories of conscious contents, including functions of consciousness. By psychic functions, Jung means a type of psychic process that has a consistent nature, regardless of what it is applied to in the moment. For example, the process of thinking is characterized by logical reasoning, regardless of the particular thought, that is, the content of the thinking process in the moment. So let's call upon the great Dr. Jung to identify what all the fuss about. Well, there is a, quite a simple explanation uh, of these uh, terms, and it, it shows at the same time how I arrived at uh, such a, uh, a typology. Uh, namely, a sensation tells you that there is something. Thinking, roughly speaking, tells you uh, what it is. Feeling tells you whether it is agreeable or not mm -hmm. to be accepted or not, accepted or rejected. Yes. 
And intuition now there is a, a difficulty. Intuition is a perception by ways or means of the unconscious. Yes. That is as near as I can get. These psychic functions, sensing, thinking, feeling and intuition, are the basic processes that facilitate consciousness. They are the ways we become aware of and integrate information. Through sense perceptions, the conscious receives information about the physical world. Hence Jung's description that sensing tells us that there is something. Our senses are our interface with the outside world. They enable us to discover the existence of things outside ego. That is, everything in the observable world that isn't part of what I think of as I. Concerned with noting new information, sensing is a perception process. Perception processes are not evaluative. That is, they do not involve making a judgment. They simply enable an awareness of the stimulus. Hence Jung's description of perception functions as irrational. Determining what is being perceived requires a different kind of function, one that is evaluative. The thinking function of consciousness tells us what the new thing is. Thinking is also what Isabel Myers called a judgment process. Jung used the term apperception. Whereas perception facilitates an awareness that something exists, through apperception, we assimilate the new awareness with what we already know. When we use thinking, the new awareness is merged with memories of what is already known to classify or label the new thing. Thinking uses a true-false kind of reasoning to decide what the new object is. A different kind of judgment function is feeling. When we use feeling, a new awareness is merged with memories that carry attendant emotional content that which Jung calls feeling tones. Where thinking is concerned with determining what the new thing is, feeling enables more qualitative evaluations, such as whether it is agreeable or not, pleasant or unpleasant, ugly or beautiful, desirable or undesirable, and so on. Jung described both thinking and feeling as rational because of their evaluative nature. Finally, there is intuition, another kind of perception that is difficult to observe directly. Jung describes intuition as a perception of the possibilities inherent in a situation. Whereas sensing perceives through the conscious apparatus, intuition perceives through the unconscious. This can seem difficult to grasp at first, for how can you perceive something through the unconscious? Where sensing detects the real world or known properties of the object, intuition detects things like context, symbolic meaning and potential, what we might describe as the unknown properties of the object. These four basic processes provide the toolkit by which we navigate life. When asked why he identified only four functions, Jung said he really didn't know why four was significant but that he was certain that the four were mutually irreducible. That is, neither sensing, intuition, thinking nor feeling can be considered a subset of another. They are each distinct processes. It should be noted that each function can be applied in either the outer world, an extroverted attitude, or the inner world, an introverted attitude, giving rise to Jung's eight mental processes, which we commonly refer to as the cognitive functions which we'll discuss further in separate talks. Whilst it might initially seem useful to develop all functions, practical experience shows that instead each of us becomes a specialist. It is this specialization, the order in which our functions differentiate, that gives rise to the different psych types. That is, if you favor sensing, rather than developing all functions equally, you will specialize in sensing developing it as your preferred orientation toward life. This preferred process is called your dominant function. A useful analogy is the hand we prefer to write with. When writing, it doesn't really matter which hand you prefer, and there is little sense in developing both since either will do the job, so we focus on developing the one that comes easiest. The same is true of life. 
All functions provide successful approaches to adaptation, and though we must be able to use each at different times, developing a tool we can always rely on is critical. In Gifts Differing, Isabel Myers explains, the supremacy of one process unchallenged by the others is essential to the stability of the individual. Each process has its own set of aims, and for successful adaptation, as Jung points out, the aims must be constantly clear and unambiguous. One process needs to govern which way a person moves. It should always be the same process so that today's move will not be regretted and reversed tomorrow. A second, somewhat less conscious function often develops alongside the dominant or primary function. This secondary function, Jung tells us, is always one whose nature is different from, though not antagonistic to, the leading function. Jung considered sensing and intuition antagonistic processes, as are thinking and feeling. Sensing and intuition perceive from diametrically opposite positions, while thinking and feeling apply opposite value systems. So if the primary function is sensing, the secondary will be either thinking or feeling, but not intuition because intuition antagonizes sensing. If the primary is feeling, then the secondary will be either sensing or intuition, but not thinking, which antagonizes feeling. Accordingly, the functions of consciousness are often represented in diagram form as the navigation points on a compass. Sensing and intuition at opposite ends of one axis, thinking and feeling at opposite ends of the other. In her discussion of good type development and gifts differing, Isabel Myers argues that together the primary and secondary functions, our pair of favoured processes which always includes a perception and a judgement function, are critical in establishing a stable direction in life. Both perception and judgement are necessary for successful adaptation. An individual who only perceives cannot move forward. Perpetually absorbing information, they are unable to decide what action to take. An individual who only judges moves chaotically through unsound and inconsistent actions, making decisions without gathering enough information to discern beneficial choices. In Isabel's far more beautiful words, perception without judgment is spineless, judgment with no perception is blind. And what of the tertiary and quaternary, or inferior functions? Jung gave surprisingly little attention to the tertiary function in his psychological types treatise. Indeed, his few and vague references to the tertiary have led to a strange acceptance of ambiguity in MBTI circles, stymieing the growth of psychological type as a credible academic field, a future discussion topic on this channel. We know from the insights of Dr. John Beebe, in publication for 30 years now, that the tertiary is opposite in nature and attitude to the secondary. And as noted above, the quaternary or inferior function is opposite in nature and attitude to the dominant. Because it antagonizes our primary modality, our fourth function tends to be relatively unconscious. The following diagram reproduced from Yolanda Jacobi provides a nice way of conceptualising this. The four sections of the pie represent the four functions of consciousness present in everyone. The upper half, where the dominant function presides, is light, indicating its relative consciousness, while its opposite, the quaternary or inferior, remains mostly in darkness, unconscious. The two functions on either side, the secondary and tertiary, are partially conscious. Ideally, by midlife, we are told we should have appropriately differentiated each of our four functions, bringing them more or less into the light of consciousness. Ever noticed how people mellow in their old age, rounding out the sharp edges of youthful character? This brings us to an interesting theme in Jungian psychology, the tension between and eventual integration of opposites. As a general rule, it is not possible for an individual to differentiate opposite functions at once. Like trying to turn left and right at the same time, this results in indecision and vacillation. Without specialisation, we remain in an infantile state, torn between opposing viewpoints, unable to rely on either. 
Through the process of differentiation, a function separates and clarifies itself from other functions. It becomes subject to conscious will and can be directed toward a goal. Yet the psyche as an energy system appears designed to keep counterbalancing our one-sidedness, compelling us to reconcile the opposites within. Most successful people achieve notoriety by virtue of their specialisation. Yet specialisation always comes at a price. The INTP academic, who has invested heavily in his thinking and intuition, discovers at some point that he is lonely and desires companionship. Yet if he wants intimacy with another, he will need to experience his sensing and feeling, for thinking and intuition will not enable him to fulfil the demands of relationship. So he faces a choice. Either he recoils from the challenge and contents himself with the fruits of his academic labour, or he embraces the opposites within and allows himself to be vulnerable for a while in the hope of finding a lover who will accept him. Regardless of type, gender, culture or social class, all of us will face a similar challenge. If we find ourselves at midlife still comfortably ensconced in our favoured functions, it is as though the psyche is wired to destabilise us, to bring about growth, integration and eventually a more balanced outlook, part of the individuation process. In future vids we'll discuss the compensatory relationship between conscious and unconscious, as well as looking at the cognitive functions and their development in greater detail. You can learn more about your psyche's innate configuration, your psych type, at interpersonality.com. Our Know Thyself package includes Just My Type, Interpersonality's 500 video foundation course on Jung's typology using Briggs and Myers model, a professional psych type indicator, and an hour with an expert to talk through anything else you want to clarify. Learn psych type, it will change your life.